So what I'll try to talk to you about uh, is a stroke, and I'll, I'll make sure that everybody passes their medical school, and we're going to have a test at the end. So, <laughs> so what, what happens when you are the first day of the medical school? Like they tell you that just sit there, look to your left, and then look to your right. One of them around you is not going to be with you when you graduate. But, uh, <laughs> but today, I think all of us uh, will stay here. Nobody will fall asleep or run away or something like that. And I'll try my best to do that. Uh, stroke has been around for a long, long time. Uh, it's been described in literature uh, almost uh, 2,400 years ago. And it's probably it was there before. Uh, it's probably by different names. Um, it used to be called apoplexy, means struck down by uh, violence. Uh, we are so fortunate that we are in this uh, era that we don't have to go through uh, trepanation. And this is not many, like a long, long ago, it's just probably 200, 300 years ago, people used to drill holes in the skull for the treatment uh, of neurological diseases. Um, uh, and uh, we feel like it is so barbaric, you know, it's like awful. How can you do that? You don't even have an anesthesia. <laughs> now imagine 100 years down the road, they will probably think about the same thing about what we are doing today. They will say, oh my God, people were crazy back then. They used to give pills. <laughs> If, if, you, if you think about it, uh, if you want to change the oil in your car, you don't open up the hood and dump the whole thing all over the, uh, all the machines and everything. You just do it right where it needs to go, into the oil tanker. But how do we give medicine today? We give medicine by mouth today. You need it in a small part of brain over here and you, we blast the whole body with that medicine. So it's probably we need to do a little better job, give a focused medicine to where we need it. Uh, but hopefully we'll get there uh, one day. And people down the road will laugh at us that, oh my God, people used to give injections and pills and well, what a crazy people. Now the things has changed. Back, back then uh, there was something called phrenology. They will touch your hair and tell you that uh, based on the shape of your skull, uh, what part uh, you have wrong. People used to think that having a stroke is like there is some evil spirit in you. And if your one part of the body is not working, they will hit you till you get this uh, stuff. Uh, and uh, cupping, <laughs> if you go to Hollywood, <laughs> you can even still see the cupping uh, being done or even bloodletting therapy. We know our uh, first president got the bloodletting therapy, so it was uh, like a state of the art treatment. Um, uh, not too far ago, lobotomies were done. Like for people who had a schizophrenia, they'll, they'll stick a knife or wire in a, a live person through their orbit and try to cut the part of the brain off. So, so fortunately, we are done with all these things. Uh, we, we don't do this type of thing, so we are hopefully at the safer place. Um, to know about brain, First, we have to uh, learn the anatomy, like how does the brain look like? Um, I usually show my uh, iPad to the people who come to see me, but I think this might be easier. So this is the front of the brain, and we're going to turn the brain around. And that's the back of the brain. This one is the bottom part, and this is the top. Different parts of the brain does different things. Uh, in the front over here, the frontal lobe, we believe does the function of thinking and imagination and planning and decision making, abstract reasoning and stuff like that. So uh, if you have damage to that part, you can't do that. Well, many of us can't do that anyway. So <laughs> now then comes to the uh, combination of uh, Hope uh, people don't mind, I make uh, crude comments sometimes. Uh, so we, we have an area called central sulcus. Um, uh, the just touch bit anterior to it means just touch bit forward to it. We have a motor strip. It means the part of the brain which makes us move. And believe me or not, it's not very large. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's probably not. Uh, I can find it much better on my iPad. That, that's what I'm uh, <coughs> used to playing this software. 
but I'm not sure whether you can see it well or not, uh, but I'll try. So this is uh, our brain, and uh, if we go and look at this thing over here, so in the whole thing, all this yellow portion, that only the yellow portion is the motor strip. That's only that little bitty tiny place makes us move. The place in front of it is actually helps us with the plan the movement. Like uh, before I'm gonna move my hand, this front part uh, lights up and actually makes a decision that, okay, this is the next movement uh, I'm gonna make. So it's, it's a very complex uh, uh, organ in a nutshell. Uh, the back over here is our occipital lobe. That part of the brain helps us see. Like we all learned uh, in kindergarten that eyes makes us see. Eyes, is, eyes are very good camera. They just take the picture and sends it to the central lab to get processed. So the brain actually does the function of uh, seeing. So if a person has a stroke into this part of the brain, their eyes can be working completely fine, but they can't see. Like there are some uh, uh, weird syndrome. There is a, a syndrome called Anton syndrome, where person can't see anything. Like uh, they get a stroke into the back of their brain, or both the side of the occipital lobe goes away, but person thinks they can see perfect. They have no uh, feeling, or they have no understanding that they have lost their vision. They are running into the wall, they can't see who is in the front, but they, they think like their vision is perfect. They, have, they, they see everything because whatever their memories are so far, they are being projected into visual cortex. Uh, uh, so they, their memory is what they see. They think that they are seeing in real life. Uh, so the brain can play a great tricks on you. Now, uh, I can keep going on and on and on about uh, anatomy of brain and uh, one hour will go away, but I'll try to focus on the stroke uh, and that's why we are here for. What is a stroke? A stroke is a disease of the brain caused by lack of blood supply to one particular part of the brain, supplied by one particular blood vessel and that part of the brain actually dies or stops functioning. Uh, uh, and that's what we call stroke as. Now, uh, it's not all or none phenomenon. It's not like the part of the brain is dead, so you have a stroke and then, the, then it will never uh, wake up again. It's like, a, like in everything in life, it's like a spectrum. Uh, what happens if you stop the blood supply to the part of the brain, the first brain goes into suspended animation, like those uh, brain cells don't have enough oxygen and glucose to function, so they don't work. If you keep that state long enough, then they will die. So that's why some people have TIA, which is transient ischemic attack. Fortunately, it was transient, means loss of blood supply was transient. Once the blood supply got restored, that part of the brain started working again, and the person's symptoms went away. So I treat TIA as aggressively as a stroke because there is a potential to save something. Like if you had a stroke and you already lost the brain, it's done, we can't do a whole lot about it. But when you have TIA, it means there is a potential to save uh, that uh, tissue. Now, uh, there are two types of stroke. One is ischemic stroke, which is more common. It was called a dry stroke. Uh, why did we call dry stroke? Uh, very simple, back in the days when we did not have a CT scan and MRI. We know somebody had a stroke after they died, right? If they died, we open up their skull and we look at the brain and see if they had a stroke or not. Fortunately, nowadays, we don't open up your skull to know whether you had a stroke or not. Uh, if you had a bleeding into your brain, we called it a quote-unquote wet stroke because we saw the blood. And when you did not have a blood going to the part of the brain, we called it a dry stroke. Uh, now we call it a ischemic infarct. Uh, now, this is just a picture of somebody who had a bleeding into their uh, brain. Now, stroke is not only a problem here in the United States, it's a problem uh, worldwide. It's actually worse problem in uh, certain countries. Um, uh, it's actually one in six person uh, during their lifetime will have a stroke. Um, uh, and lots of people die from stroke. So every minute, around 10 people die from stroke. Um, um, it is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. When I was in medical school, 
It was the third leading cause of death in the United States. So we are doing a good job. This is going down. It's, it's very impressive. If you look at the uh, stroke mortality compared to 1940s uh, to today, it has gone down significantly. Uh, I don't think neurologists can take a credit for it. Uh, I think the primary care physician should get a credit for it uh, because we are doing a good job controlling the blood pressure and diabetes and cholesterol. People are more taking uh, aspirin, less people uh, they smoke and <coughs> people are working on quitting smoking and stuff like that. So I think we are doing a good job, but I don't think uh, neurologists should take a credit for it. I think it's the primary care physician should take a credit for uh, reducing the uh, stroke. But uh, you know there is a saying, they say like if we keep going on at the same rate with obesity, in next 10 to 15 years we will wipe out every single advance we have done in medicine because the cost and complications of obesity will be so much more that whatever life years that we have saved trying to control other diseases will get wiped out. Uh, and we'll talk about it more. How does the stroke look like macroscopically? Like once you open up the skull, how does it look like? So this is a soon after a person had a stroke. Uh, you can tell there is a difference. Like this side of the white matter looks different than this side. There is some swelling or edema. And that swelling or edema is much more obvious in this area. It's not the same patient. but. A uh, person can have a hemorrhagic conversion to their ischemic infarct. Like uh, if you block the blood vessel and the, the blood is not going and the part of the brain dies uh, and the, the blood vessel becomes very porous. For some reason, if you open up that blood vessel and blood rush through it, can actually cause more damage. Uh, and blood can leak out of that blood vessel and give you a hemorrhagic infarct. That's why there is a time sensitiveness, like there is a time window of three hours so in some patients four and a half hours that we can give a medicine called TPA, which is a tissue plasminogen activator, means a clot buster medicine. We can't give you like after two days or three days. Why not? You know, just open up the clot and open up that blood vessel and uh, let the blood go through. But it can be more dangerous, like once the uh, the stroke has established, once the blood vessels has uh, died uh, downstream, you burst that clot and let the blood go through, the blood might come out of the blood vessel and uh, can lead you to a bigger problem. That's why we don't do that. How does it look like two years, five years, ten years later? Uh, fortunately, gliosis uh, or, and macrophages, so means parts of the brain, uh, the healing process happens and the that tissue gets eaten up. Uh, uh, some people can develop scar tissue from it uh, and can have seizures and stuff like that, but uh, uh, it is possible to recover from the stroke. Uh, the most important thing is to recognize as our brain does everything in our body uh, and controls everything, it's very hard to know uh, that any symptoms you have can be coming from a stroke. Like if I have a numbness in my pinky finger, can it be coming from stroke? Yeah, it is possible, uh, but it's more likely that it's ulnar neuropathy. Uh, <laughs> so if I have a numbness in my first digit, can it be uh, the, the stroke? Well, it is possible, it's more likely carpal tunnel syndrome. That's why it's, it's so hard to differentiate whether who had a stroke and who did not. But in general, uh, American Academy of uh, Neurology and American Heart Association came up uh, with this very simple thing to remember. It's fast. If you see a sudden droopiness of the face, like the half uh, of the face is drooping, or the person cannot move their arm or leg, or they have difficulty talking, that has to be a new symptom. It's not like person has difficulty talking for last 10 years and you just recognize it now <laughs> that I call my mom 10 years later and oh my mom is not talking right, call 911. Well mom has not been talking right for so long, it's just you don't know. Uh, the same thing happens, person wakes up in the morning and they realize that their face is not right. Now when did that happen? Did it happen in the middle of the night? It just happened in the morning or it happened the last evening, it's very hard to know. So knowing the time it starts, it's very, very important. Uh, 
It's very, very important to call 911. You won't believe me. Uh, I had this phone call just this morning when the one patient called us and told us that, oh, my left side is weak. It's almost paralyzed. What should I do? Call 911. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very sad, you know, that uh, uh, patients feel like that uh, what, they, what they will be able to do. Like once I go to the hospital, what different they're going to do if, if uh, you have read enough and you know that, oh, after three hours, I can't get a TPA. Doesn't mean you can't get a care. It's still, it's important to call 911 and get to the hospital as, as fast as you can because uh, time is brain. The more time you lose, uh, there are so many brain cells a person is losing when they are uh, having a stroke. Uh, this is just a random slide I put it together. Uh, uh, has lots of uh, CT scans and MRIs and stuff like that. But we'll get back to this if we have a time. Let's talk more about uh, the things that is more practical and that's probably useful in life. Uh, so what are the stroke risk factors? Like if we want to stop something, we have to reduce the risk factors of stroke. Uh, and there are some modifiable risk factors and there are some non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, I have patients come and tell me that, Doc, I did everything right in my life. You know, I exercised every day. Uh, I never had a high blood pressure, never had a cholesterol, I never smoked, I don't drink heavy, like I still had a stroke. Why? Well, it's because of the non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, as of we age, our blood vessels do get sicker. Uh, if we have positive family history, uh, no matter what you do, you can have a stroke. But we can, what we can do is to reduce our chances, means uh, reduce the risk. And that's what we can work on is our modifiable risk factors. Uh, so let's uh, look at uh, one thing at a time. Blood pressure, is this the number one modifiable risk factor for stroke uh, is the blood pressure. What is blood pressure anyway? Blood pressure is uh, like the amount of pressure applied onto the vessel wall by the blood because of the pumping action of the heart. Uh, I tried to search this thing uh, online, but I can't find it. I hope everybody can see it. I'll try to uh, keep it up uh, as much as possible. This <coughs> is based on the heart, but it's very similar phenomenon uh, happens uh, into the brain. Um, and hopefully it will come up. Now, um, first we will look at the blood pressure. We are zooming in into the one of the coronary blood vessel. Now we opened it up. What you can see? You can see the vessel wall, which has three layers, which has the intima. It means the inside lining. Then it has a media, where we have the muscle fibers. And then there we have advantasia, which is the outermost lining uh, uh, of the blood vessel. All these uh, spiky things that you see is the platelets. Uh, they are the one which sticks uh, to the blood vessel. And then the red thing you see is the red blood cells. And the yellow thing you see is the cholesterol. Uh, now what happens? This is a normal blood vessel where you don't see a lot of crackling of the inside skin. But what if you have a prehypertension? If you have prehypertension, you start having crackling or some cracks into the inside of the blood vessel wall. And uh, the platelets start sticking. It's probably hard to see, but uh, the, the spiky things, they are now going into the vessel and uh, the cholesterol plaques also gets deposited. Now, if we don't do anything and we keep letting it go, the cracks are more often. And uh, you see that there is a development of plaque or narrowing into the blood vessel. Uh, now, uh, Till this time, person has no symptom. They feel like I am just fine. I am not having any weakness. I am not having any numbness. Uh, fortunately, God put so much physiological reserve. Like, uh, uh, for example, our blood, our blood vessel is able to carry 100 ml per hour, uh, just in a hypothetical number. We can function by only 20 ml. Uh, so we have a physiological reserve of 80. Uh, so if you keep narrowing that blood vessel, you will have no symptom till it is like 79. 
the day it is 81, you start having some symptoms. So it means the day you have symptom, you have lost all the physiological reserve and now you are getting into that critical phase when you actually start having symptoms. So if you are thinking about prevention, the day you have a symptom, the horse is already out of the barn. Um, now, now what happens, um, uh, a person comes and tells me, the dog, I was just fine yesterday. Why did I have a stroke today? <laughs> now what happens, you already have that plaque. But if the plaque ruptures, uh, so if you cut the skin, it bleeds and then it uh, clogs. The same thing happens inside. If you rupture that surface of the plaque, a clotting happens and it blocks the blood vessel right then and then. So even though you feel like yesterday I was just fine and today I had a stroke, all your risk factor didn't come overnight. It's just a combination of years and years of uh, high blood pressure or obesity or smoking that showed up when the plaque got uh, ruptured. Now let's see if we can find the animation for cholesterol. This is a very similar thing uh, but for cholesterol. This is a when you have a normal lipid profile versus uh, you have a lipid profile which is re looking really bad. So there is so much uh, uh, lipids or uh, cholesterol and stuff, the blood, uh, the blood has a really hard time going through it. Like my neighbor, uh, he was a phlebotomist. He said when, when he used to do the transfusion, there are people, you stick the needle in, instead of white, almost yellowish stuff comes out. Like whatever we eat does really go uh, to the blood. Now, uh, let's see. We are talking about blood pressure. How can we reduce the blood pressure? The DASH diet has the most evidence uh, to reduce blood pressure and reduce the weight. It's not very sexy diet. You know, people don't talk about it. Uh, uh, it doesn't get any promotion because nobody gets any money out of it. <laughs> But it came out back in 1979. NIH, National Institute of Health, came up with this diet. And it actually works really, really well. Um, uh, just uh, Google it, uh, DASH diet, D-A-S-H. If you don't have a blood pressure machine, it's a good time to buy it. At least once a week, uh, if you don't have known high blood pressure, once a week you should check your blood pressure in the morning and see your numbers. Uh, because uh, as little as a 20 systolic and 10 diastolic, if you reduce that much of blood pressure, it can reduce your stroke risk by 50%. That's a humongous gain just by reducing a little bit of blood pressure. Now, we shouldn't go overboard, you know, we don't wanna be passing out, um, like this is the problem, like uh, when we try to be too aggressive, we lower the blood pressure so much, person gets dizzy and stuff like that, so that's not what I'm telling. What I'm talking about, if your blood pressure is high, prehypertension or hypertension, it needs to be controlled uh, really well. Women specifically are at higher risk of stroke because of uh, multiple reasons. Uh, sorry, it's a very busy slide. Uh, because of pregnancy and preeclampsia, pregnancy increases the risk uh, of stroke uh, primarily because many women during pregnancy gets preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is increasing the blood pressure. The other thing is birth control pills. Uh, birth control pills slightly, very slightly, increases the risk of uh, having stroke. Um, and same as a hormone replacement therapy. Like uh, back in the 70s and 80s, we thought that hormone replacement therapy might actually reduce the stroke risk. But now we know for sure it increases the stroke risk. It doesn't increase a whole lot, but it still increases it. Uh, Migraine with aura. So the people who has a migraine headaches and they, have been, they get auras, they have increased the risk uh, of stroke. But unfortunately, there is no definite research that if you control the uh, migraine aura as well, it reduces the stroke risk. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but it's a good idea to control your migraine. Now, atrial fibrillation. That is the irregular rhythm of the heart, when the heart is supposed to pump regularly, but if it doesn't pump regularly, that is also more common in women compared to the men. So the women are at a little bit higher risk of having stroke. So let's talk about one thing individually. 
And uh, number one thing I will talk about is atrial fibrillation. What is atrial fibrillation? So in our heart, we have atria and we have ventricle. There is a something called SA node, uh, sinoatrial node. And from there, it's like electrical impulse starts and goes uh, to the rest of the brain. Um, uh, I have a friend, he's a cardiothoracic surgeon and uh, he's a very spiritual guy. Uh, he tells his patient that the reason I'm opening up your chest is because I want to see the God. I feel like SA node is where the, the impulse starts is, is the God. So when he's doing surgery, he, before he does surgery, he tells every patient this, that I'm opening up your chest because I want to see the God. Um, now, patients who has atrial fibrillation, they are five times uh, higher risk uh, of uh, having stroke because uh, we believe that uh, during the irregular rhythm of the heart, a person can throw a blood clot. Now, every person should check their pulse. So let me teach you guys how to check a pulse. So uh, take your non-dominant hand. So if you are right-handed, take your left hand and put right over here, like just above your wrist on the outer side. Put your two fingers. You should be able to feel your heart pulsating as a pulse. Now, um, there are many places in our body we can check the pulse. We can check a brachial pulse and carotid pulse, but this is very simple. So let's do the simple things. Um, now, uh, uh, it's a good idea to check your pulse and make sure that it is going rhythmically. Now, sometimes you can have an uh, PVCs or PSE. It means uh, sometimes you can have a skip beat one or two, that's okay. But if you notice your, your pulse is continuously irregular, then you should get checked out uh, and make sure you do not have atrial fibrillation because many patients who have atrial fibrillation, they don't know that they have atrial fibrillation. The day you find out is when you have a stroke and they check your heart uh, and they find out. So rather than finding out that way, let's find out the easier way. So everybody in society should know how to check their pulse uh, and should check it at least once a week. You know, it doesn't hurt. You know, it uh, doesn't cost you any money. Uh, it's a very simple thing to do. Uh, once you find out uh, that a person has atrial fibrillation, EKG is very useful. But I won't ask, I won't teach you how to read this one. <laughs> it will be out of course for today. Now, um, what we used to give people is uh, a rat bait. It was a rat poison, which is a warfarin. Um, for people who has atrial fibrillation, we give warfarin all the time, and it was uh, actually, it's very good rat poison. Uh, <laughs> um, and the problem with the warfarin is we have to check uh, the, uh, the blood, the INR, keep the INR in the right range. Uh, Fortunately, in the last couple of years, we do have warfarin alternatives. Uh, uh, we have Pradaxa, uh, we have Pixaban, and Rivaroxaban. So fortunately, the, the, there are alternatives that now we don't have to uh, check uh, INR. Uh, but the thing is cost. Uh, it's still all our brand name medicines and still more expensive. But uh, the thing is, if you, go, if you consider the INR checking cost, it's not, uh, uh, it's not that expensive. And the thing is, patients who are on Coumarin, 75% of the time, they are in their INR range, but 25% of the time, they are out of INR range. So if you are still taking Coumarin and you are not, uh, your AFib uh, is not well controlled and your, uh, uh, the blood is not thin enough, uh, are we doing uh, any good? Uh, now comes the diabetes. Diabetes is a silent killer. Uh, if, some, if, if a God comes and tells me that, let me give you something, whatever you want, what I will ask. I will ask that if the people's sugar go up, it should hurt. <laughs> That's what I want from God, that if, if a person's sugar go up, then certain, like 140, let's come up with a number, it should hurt. Because diabetes is a silent killer, when your sugar goes up, you don't feel anything most of the time. So, uh, we don't realize that it is hurting our body. And after 15, 20 years, when we see the complications, uh, person has diabetic peripheral neuropathy and stuff like that, at that time it starts hurting. But uh, it should hurt from get-go. Then we will have much better control uh, 
of the diabetes. Uh, it can give lots of uh, problems. I have uh, a good animation, but I'll, I'll skip it. Uh, another thing is cholesterol. Uh, all cholesterols are not bad. You know, there are good cholesterol and there is a bad cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is actually an essential part of our body. We need it uh, for the uh, making of the cell membrane and it's important for the development of brain. So uh, everything, every cholesterol is not bad, but we just have to figure out what is good and what is, uh, what is bad. Uh, I, I already showed you the cholesterol um, uh, animation for the, what, how the blood vessel looks inside uh, uh, when the cholesterol is very high, bad cholesterol is very high. Now, uh, when we are looking at the stroke, we got to look at the pipeline because the pipeline is where which carries the blood to the brain. So this is the pipeline. So down over here is aorta and then this is a common carotid artery and this is the internal carotid artery uh, which takes the blood to the brain and this is the external carotid artery. That's the blood vessel that takes uh, blood to the face and stuff like that. Um, most of the time when people develop a plaque or narrowing, they develop right here in the bulb uh, of the carotid where we have the bifurcation. Fortunately, we have lots of uh, non-invasive and invasive ways of finding out if somebody has a narrowing into their carotid. Most common one is ultrasound. We put an ultrasound, as you know, ultrasound is just uh, sophisticated sound waves that we throw very high frequency sound waves and see how they come back. Uh, and we can calculate uh, based on the Doppler, what is the velocity, means how fast the uh, blood is going in. They use actually the same principle for this Malaysian aircraft uh, that uh, initially they didn't recognize, but then they did the recalculation that uh, what the waves came back, uh, what was their frequency and what was the frequency difference. Uh, we use the same thing. When we throw the uh, sound waves to the blood, uh, the blood moves. Uh, and then when it comes back, uh, the, the waves are different. It depends upon how fast the blood moved. So that way you can uh, put the mathematical calculation and come up with the, uh, once you know the throwing wavelength and once you know the what wavelength you get back, you can come up with the what's the velocity of the thing that you are trying to measure. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to go in physics. Now, uh, another thing is the CT scan. We can do a CT scan trying to find out uh, uh, how much is the narrowing. Um, fortunately, uh, we have this uh, reconstruction uh, capacity at ARMC as well. So whenever I, I the, uh, see the CT of the neck, we do the reconstruction uh, and uh, we can look at how the blood vessels uh, look like. Um, we can also do the MRA, which is magnetic resonance and geography. It's the fancy uh, MRI to see how the uh, blood vessels. Uh, but the gold standard is uh, and geography, like uh, what we used to do in 60s and 70s, that uh, uh, puncture the blood vessel, go up uh, with the wire, uh, shoot a die and it can tell you exactly what is the inside uh, lumen of a blood vessel. Now um, once we find out that somebody has a carotid stenosis, what do we do? Now that's, that's uh, my portion, I won't uh, bore you with this, but uh, uh, we have to decide whether the person is symptomatic or asymptomatic, means they are having any neurological symptoms or not. And are those neurological symptoms because of the stenosis or because of something else? Once we figured out that, oh, person is having neurological symptoms and they are likely because of the carotid stenosis, uh, then we should get the surgery done. If the stenosis is more than 60 to 70 percent. Uh, but now the tricky portion comes is asymptomatic people. Like you don't have any symptoms. Uh, we just heard a brewery on your neck. Uh, uh, Brewery means abnormal sound when we uh, listen to the neck. Uh, and um, uh, we, we heard the abnormal sound and now we did the ultrasound and now you have a narrowing. Now you don't have any symptoms. Should we subject to, uh, to an elective surgery or not? That's a harder question because uh, uh, there is a good old principle. If it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. <laughs> so uh, that... Uh, that we have to come up with the, some good research and see. So we, now we know that if uh, 
the center you are getting the keratin and tracheotomy done, if their complication rate is less than 3%, then it's worthwhile doing things because there might be some more perioperative mortality and morbidity, means there might be some complication around the surgery. But in long run, it does significantly reduces uh, your uh, uh, stroke risk. Uh, and this is what the uh, surgeon does. Uh, uh, once you find out that there is a narrowing, they open up the blood vessel, they take the blood clot out, and they sew it back up. Uh, so that's just a picture, and this is actually the real life. Uh, um, and uh, it doesn't look uh, pretty, but it does get better as the time goes on. Now imagine if the surgeon has to do the same thing on the other neck. Uh, the job gets harder and harder. Uh, now, uh, what if I don't wanna get opened up? Can, can something be done non-invasively? Uh, yes, uh, we can put a stent these days where we put the catheter and we go up. Instead of cutting your blood vessel open, and removing the clot, why can't we just put a stent and open it up, like a do a balloon and open it up? Uh, it's possible, but uh, believe me, the complication rate on this thing is very similar to complication rate on open one. So there is a still debate, and we, we individualize patient, like uh, uh, depending upon where your lesion is and uh, what is more, what surgeon is more comfortable with, and a lot of factors, so uh, what we think that what's the plaque made up of, uh, now, uh, again, let's recoup. Uh, in a nutshell, what we talked so far was the blood clot can either come from the heart or you can have a narrowing of the blood vessel or you can have the narrowing of the blood vessel all the way up over there. Uh, now, I briefly touched about uh, migraine. So I'm just going to reiterate it one more time that uh, what is migraine aura? Sometimes it can, it can be confusing with the stroke if you are having it for the first time ever in your life. Uh, like you feel like there is a, a zigzag lines or floaters or something in front of your eyes and the light bothers you and the noise bothers you. Uh, and then you have very severe uh, headache. Uh, some people get nausea and vomiting and uh, stuff like that. If it's happening for the first time, yes, it is scary and uh, uh, should get checked out. But if it's been happening all your life, and it's most likely it's a uh, migraine aura. Now, um, uh, sickle cell disease, it doesn't get talked about a whole lot uh, because it's not a, a generally applicable thing to everybody. But I work uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Adams when I was an uh, intern, and he's a very smart guy. Uh, he came up with a, a TCD, transcranial Doppler, for patients with sickle cell anemia. And we can reduce the stroke uh, uh, significantly, almost cut it in the half uh, just by giving them blood transfusion. Uh, and uh, he, he worked on it uh, for years and years. And uh, now we routinely do uh, blood transfusion in patients with uh, sickle cell disease, and it has reduced their uh, stroke significantly. Let's talk about more common things uh, that uh, might be applicable to many people and that is cigarette smoking. And it's not only the first hand uh, cigarette smoking, it can be even second hand cigarette smoking can affect you. When we just look at the, when we read this, it's not that impressive, but when you see the pictures, uh, it can show you that uh, what cruel things uh, smoking can do. Uh, uh, it releases so many different uh, toxins that you won't even touch uh, on a, on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Uh, um, the things that have been used to make steel, uh, it's there in the cigarette smoke, and uh, things that uh, we consider as a radiation hazard, it's there in cigarette smoke. Uh, but it's a very hard thing to get, uh, uh, get rid of. Um, it not only affects your lung, most of the people think that the cigarette smoking affects the lung. Cigarette smoking affects the brain as well, not only by making the, the blood vessels uh, narrow, we believe, it's not listed over here, but we believe it increases the risk of dementia because the Alzheimer's pathology is more often in people who smoke compared to people who do not smoke or have first-hand or second-hand exposure to smoke. I'm not going to go through every single uh, issue that smoking can do, but uh, CDC uh, came up with um, 
uh, the labels uh, on the box, but it got denounced. Like uh, otherwise, I think it should have gone onto the uh, cigarette box uh, uh, labeling. Like they were planning to put these pictures uh, on the cigarette label. So they went, every single time you use it, you sh we should think. Uh, you can think about it. Uh, it also causes aging. You know, many people don't think about it, but uh, this is just the two twins. Uh, the, the one twin smoked and the one twin didn't smoke. Even your skin can tell a person uh, uh, is smoking or not. If you think there is a subtle changes in the face that happens uh, that you don't see right away, it get uh, picked up after years and years uh, that you have a changes on the face that happens. Uh, now, uh, horse is already out of the barn, dog. I've been already smoking for 30 years. Now, do I really need to stop? Like, does it gonna make any difference? Yes, it does make a difference. Uh, as soon as a person stops smoking, within 20 minutes, uh, their heart rate and blood pressure starts dropping. So the, so the benefit is immediate and benefit is long lasting. So after 15 years, uh, the risk of uh, heart disease and stroke is very similar to the people who had never smoked. So uh, U-turn is always possible at, at any age, doesn't matter how many years a person st smoked. Uh, are we gonna be able to get rid of all the side effects? Probably not, but can we make an improvement? Yes, definitely. Um, now, uh, we have lots and lots of resources. Your doctor can help. Plus, uh, now uh, uh, so many websites can help. Like nowadays, everybody uses smartphones. So there are apps you can download uh, for smoking. There are texts you can get on your phone, like a, as a reminder text. Uh, and there is a even phone line. Uh, there is a free phone line that a person can call into. Uh, let's talk about <laughs> let's let, let's talk about uh, weight, uh, and and it, it's not a problem only here. It's it's a, it's been getting a worldwide problem. Can you imagine obesity's problem in South Africa? Like, <laughs> uh, which is the uh, which country in the world has the highest obesity rates? <laughs> no, it's Mexico. Oh, Mexico. Yep. Uh, Yes, Mexico has a higher obesity rates than us. Uh, um, this is a uh, county-wise chart of uh, uh, BMI, uh, body mass index, uh, and we know uh, the soul food uh, doesn't help a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> now, this is a complex chart. I want everybody to remember every single number on this. <laughs> no, not necessarily. It's just a chart of what is your height, and for this height, what weight is your, uh, what BMI? So I came up with mine, and mine is 25. You know, if you just uh, look at, if I look myself into the mirror, I didn't feel like I was, I was classified as an overweight, but I'm classified as an overweight. Now, why is that? Because our norms changes. Like when you watch TV and they have a, a like 500 pound person, they are uh, associating it as an obese person. So our mind subconsciously think that only 500 pound person is an obese person. Everything below that is probably okay. So <laughs> I have had people whose BMI was like 42. And I asked them straightforward question, do you think you are obese? And they will say no. BMI of 40 will drop you somewhere down here in the range of uh, 276 uh, pound weight person uh, with a height of uh, 5 foot 7 each, like my height. And if I ask them point blank, do you think you're obese? And they will say no. They are under super obese category, but they don't think they are obese because Every single person in the family, every single person in the neighborhood is bigger than me. So, <laughs> so I'm not that big. Uh, and it's an illusion. Uh, which dot is bigger? They're the same. They are the same, that's right. They are the same, but this one looks bigger compared to this one because what our reference range is. Uh, now, it's so easy to tell people, eat right. You know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, it's very easy to say. But there are some pointers that I, I give out to people. And one is the plate size uh, or a portion size. Uh, 
what we eat is so much subconscious. It just happens as a reflex. Uh, I'll show you some studies down the road, but um, if you give people bigger ball, they eat more. If you give people smaller ball, they eat less. It's, it's that simple, but it's that difficult. Uh, now, color of the plate. When we put a red color plate, people tend to eat less than the other color plate because we associate subconsciously red as a stop. <laughs> Our refrigerator design is really, really bad where vegetable section is all the way down, which is hard to reach. So when we designed the refrigerators, they made a big mistake. Whenever you, put a whenever you put anything in the refrigerator, make sure you put healthy food at the eye level, because that's what you're gonna grab the first. Same thing in the pantry. You, when you put the things in the pantry, put a healthy food at eye level, and unhealthy food all the way down or all the way up. It's a very minor change you can do that can make a huge difference. Uh, think about food one hour before you get hungry. Most of the time we think about food when we are hungry. Like when we are really hungry, then we'll, oh, I'm so busy, I, can't, I have so many things to do. I'll think about food when I get hungry. But that's the time we make the worst mistake. Like when you're hungry, rationality just goes away. <laughs> you eat whatever is right there. So always think about food one hour before you're gonna get hungry. So more likely that person will make a rational decision. It's so simple, right? Listen to your stomach. We don't listen to our stomach. We deprive our cell of food when we are hungry because of the time and hundred uh, reasons. And we overeat when we are not hungry. Like if you go to a movie and buy a big popcorn, you are not hungry, but you're gonna finish the whole thing <laughs> because it's there. So uh, we have to start listening to our stomach. You know, when I was young, my mom always told me, you have to clean the plate. The plate has to be empty. <laughs> so that's, that's what ingrained in my mind that no matter how satisfied I am, I have to keep eating till the plate is done. Now, if you compare to 1960s plate to uh, 2014 plate, the plate has gotten significantly bigger. Like if you go to a buffet, like it's a super size me, it's like super Mac. It's, uh, it's, everything is so big and we are, we are subconsciously inclined to finish the thing what we are given to us. Uh, don't go hungry, that's the mistake people make. Uh, I have had people tell me that, Doc, I just only eat one time a day. How can I be gaining weight? That's why you are gaining weight. Because you are depriving yourself of food. Our bodies are not made to live in city. Our body is made to live in the jungle. When there can be food one day, and there might not be food another day. So our body thinks in a jungle sense that if I'm not getting food, there must be really, really scarcity of food out there. So whatever goes in, I got a store because I might not get food uh, tomorrow or day after tomorrow. So I have to save for future. So that's why don't deprive yourself of uh, uh, food. There are some, they have done a very fantastic study uh, at uh, one prestigious university in Cornell in New York. Uh, uh, they, uh, they had a, like a gathering of PhD students and uh, professors. Uh, the half the group, they gave a smaller bowl and half group, they gave a bigger bowl. They're all smart people. The people who had a bigger bowl, it's 73% more. Like, <laughs> intellectually, everybody's the same, but they just ate more just because their bowl was bigger. Now, um, uh, they, they gave it to the moviegoers. We think that the uh, food has to do with the taste. So what they did, they gave big baskets of bad popcorn and a good popcorn. People ate equal amount. <laughs> so even if it's a bad popcorn, but it's already somebody's giving me for free, I'm gonna finish it. <laughs> uh, we talked about uh, plate, uh, plate size. If we can just reduce the plate size, we can actually reduce the significant amount of food we eat. Uh, nowadays, they, they, they sell stuff in a bigger and bigger packaging. They put less food in it, but they, okay. the packaging is so big. <laughs> Uh, uh, they, what we can do is whatever unhealthy food is there, we can make it into the smaller package. So like if you're going to eat two cookies from this thing, you won't feel bad. But if you're opening up two bags to eat two separate cookies, 
it's less likely that you will do that. Uh, now, uh, healthier food, we can pack it bigger, bigger boxes or uh, bigger package. So we probably will eat more healthier food than unhealthier food. Uh, soda, I can't uh, talk, uh, uh, can't even get started on this. Uh, uh, for a small can of soda, there is 10 uh, spoons of sugar. Uh, so most of the time we are drinking pure sugar when uh, we are drinking soda. And so-called uh, uh, healthy juices, they are also loaded with calories. So you gotta be very, very careful when you pick your drink. It's not only what you eat, but also what you drink. Water is the best fluid to drink. How can you drink more water? Carry a water bottle with you. That's, that's the best thing you can do. Now, whenever we get our coffee, we try to put a whipped cream on it and uh, uh, hazelnut, and uh, it's, everything tastes good because it's a lot of sugar. Um, now, uh, you know, home-cooked food is so much more better than a fast food. Fast food, we have no control what goes inside the food. So uh, it's much, much better to eat home-cooked food, but nobody has time. That's the problem. Nobody has time today. Um, now, um, uh, whenever I talk about uh, food, people say that, oh, you are telling me to eat less. No, no, no. I'm not telling you to eat less. Sometimes you can eat more and weigh less. How is that going to happen? <laughs> Uh, looks very similar quantity of the food, but if you just change the content uh, of food, <coughs> you can still eat larger amount of food with much less calories. Uh, just look at this illusion. Uh, this is the oil you get if you eat something really oily, 400 calories, gonna fill up your stomach this much. The same 400 calories, if you have to eat this many fruits and vegetables to fill your stomach up. So. Before you start eating, eat in salad or something. So you, you're going to feel full and still not have as much calorie. So the, we have to think about calorie density, like how dense a food we are eating. Um, desserts are usually a disaster. Uh, <laughs> we love it, but I love it. Uh, now, being active uh, is, is very, very important. This is a chart of physical inactivity and it's kind of coincides with the chart of uh, uh, obesity because uh, these days we are much less physically active than what we used to be back in the days you know now we take out car for every single thing uh, we don't walk at all uh, there is no walking on the farm or out in the woods uh, kids are on the uh, video game all the time or on their smartphone uh, but we got to get uh, uh, better with the uh, physical games. Uh, there are lots of uh, benefits to physical activity. Uh, and uh, I have listed some. The important one that struck me a long time ago is preventing cancer. So there is a research to prove that if you exercise regularly, it reduces your cancer risk, the, uh, specifically the colon cancer and breast cancer. So. Uh, not only your diabetes is going to get better, weight is going to get better, muscle is going to be stronger, the person will have less chances of falling, uh, but you can even reduce the cancer by uh, exercising regularly. Now, uh, these are the common excuses uh, I get. Uh, I don't have time, uh, the weather is bad outside, I don't have resources, like I don't have a treadmill or anything at home. Uh, all of them has an explanation, like we can uh, come across it or uh, uh, get through these barriers. Uh, everybody has time. We just have to find the right time. Uh, parking, we will drive around in the parking lot finding that the right parking spot, uh, instead of parking the farthest possible away and then walk to the store. Uh, now, uh, uh, I'm trying to rush. I know I have only five minutes left. Uh, so uh, dancing can be a very good thing to do. Uh, and sports is not only for young people. Sports makes us young. Oh, Doc, I have sports in my life. What's your sport? Oh, I watch, I watch sports. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to be involved uh, with it. Um, uh, preventing stroke, all the basic things. Uh, manage the blood pressure, eat right, be physically active, uh, lower the cholesterol, lower the sugar, 
and uh, uh, don't smoke. Uh, uh, the final uh, remark is to know what the stroke looks like and call 911. That's the most important thing you can do.